So to end today's talk, I thought it would be interesting to actually do a comparison of um, virtualizability properties for both the ARM and the x86 architectures. Um, so sometime in 2000, uh, during the Usenix Security Symposium, um, Cynthia Irvine and John Scott Robin actually presented an analysis of the Intel x86 architecture. And they basically studied which of the x86 instructions violate uh, which requirements of Popek and Goldberg's uh, specification way back in 1973 or 4. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll not get into the details about each instruction, but you, know, you basically have instructions like uh, you know, pop f, and uh, you have instructions like um, software interrupt, and so on on x86, which violate the Popek and Goldberg requirement. Uh, very similarly, you actually have the MRS and MSR on the ARM, instru uh, ARM instruction set, which are read and write of the CPSR, um, and, and many other instructions that actually violate uh, different kinds of requirements of Popek and Goldberg. Uh, you know, the, the summary is that they happen to violate um, different requirements or different sets of requirements, but at the end of the day, they all do violate uh, these requirements, and they present challenges in terms of uh, doing CPU virtualization. In some sense, before we uh, you know, implemented this ARM virtualization, uh, you know, so one would uh, be led to naively think that given ARM is a uh, you know, risk, you know, simpler instruction set than x86, it should probably be much easier to virtualize. But you know, at the end of the day, when you analyze the instructions from a virtualizability perspective, they both do actually violate the requirements in different ways. Um, in terms of ring compression itself, as I talked about in terms of the protection mechanisms, uh, x86 actually has segmentation and paging as two orthogonal protection mechanisms, uh, whereas ARM only has paging. ARM does have another uh, you know, sort of uh, alternate protection mechanism called domains, but it's actually not orthogonal to paging. The problem with uh, the domain support is actually it, it works in concert with paging. It's, it's very much uh, implemented through paging. So, uh, the idea in the case of domains is basically that uh, you have a set of domains. Let's say, in, in ARM's case, I think you have 16 domains or something like that. Um, and you can actually denote a given page table entry to belong to a particular domain. So let's say you denote a particular page table entry to belong to domain 3. And then you have a global register called a domain access control register where you actually uh, where the, the operating system actually gets to configure the register with different kinds of access permission uh, properties for different domains. So at any point of time, it can say domain 3 should actually have no access at all, which means given that page table entry is marked as domain 3, and given that uh, the, the current domain access control register says domain 3 should have no access at all, Irrespective of what the access permissions bits themselves say on the page table entries themselves, the hardware actually denies access to the currently executing uh, you know, thread of control as far as that page table entry is concerned. And because the domains are actually specified as part of the page table entries, it's actually not at all orthogonal to paging. It's very much implemented in concert with paging. And because of that, we actually do not have the luxury of being able to use you know, one mechanism to emulate another, and so on, which is why we had to resort to the dual shadow page tables that I talked about. Uh, in terms of other differences, uh, you know, th there's this very uh, sort of archaic topic, but very important topic uh, in the case of hiding the monitor, in, in the case of protecting the monitor from the guest, which is the ability to be able to execute instructions but not necessarily read or write data uh, for, you know, on the same set of addresses. Uh, so you typically need this, for example, when you're doing binary translation. You want, to be, you want the guest to be able to execute off of the translation cache, but at the same time not be able to read or write from or to into the translation cache. And on x86, for example, you almost have this implicitly. You uh, have a different segment register for the code and for data. Specifically, you can actually set up the code segment or the CS uh, segment register so that it has access to a set of addresses so that instruction fetches would continue without any problems. And you can set up the data segment or the DS register or all the other segment registers 
so that that set of addresses is not accessible. And that way, you can actually ensure that execution is possible, but read and write is not possible. But on the ARM architecture, you, you do not have that luxury. And um, like in some architectures in the 60s or whenever it was, when you had orthogonal bits for read, write, and execute in a very simple and straightforward manner on page tables, uh, un unlike those times, you, you do not have that luxury on the ARM architecture either. They did introduce another uh, piece of support called the no execute or the do not execute support, just like x86 did that a while back. But it turns out that that's not what we want necessarily, because that one is actually targeting a different problem, which is you uh, should be able to read and write, but you should not be able to execute. And that actually is to protect against certain kinds of uh, you know, uh, stack overflow uh, uh, exploitations and things like that. Um, so on the ARM architecture, because you do not have that explicit distinction between being able to execute and read, uh, it leads to a lot of problems in terms of doing binary translation and in, in some other challenges. Um, in terms of the cache architectures themselves, x86 largely presents a transparent uh, cache architecture interface. You know, uh, it, it's traditionally what we call the physically indexed, physically tagged uh, cache architecture across all versions. Um, on the ARM architecture, it actually exposes a lot of the cache architecture to the um, uh, you know, instruction set interface. Uh, that has been changing uh, somewhat, though. ARM has been moving more towards the physically indexed, indexed physically tagged uh, cache architecture in the recent past. But it has, in its previous versions, in version 5 and version 6 and so on, it has had various different cache architectures. And those present their own set of, sets of challenges in terms of virtualizing, in terms of presenting the right interface of the cache and of the memory and so on. Um, in terms of instruction sizes, x86 has a variable instruction size uh, set. You know, an instruction can be anywhere from 1 to 16 bytes or something like that the last time I saw the x86 architecture. Um, and the ARM architecture largely has a fixed instruction set. It does have certain variations like ARM and thumb and so on. But it largely has either 32-bit or 16-bit and so on. Um, this enables some uh, cool techniques like in-place patching, in-place binary translation, and so on, which uh, perhaps would have been uh, a lot more difficult, if not impossible, on the x86 architecture. Um, in terms of I.O. accesses, x86 actually has explicit I.O. instructions in addition to the memory mapped I.O. accesses that you can perform through uh, normal memory accesses. ARM actually has uh, memory mapped I.O. only, purely memory mapped I.O. accesses. And this allows you to interpose uh, in the case of I.O. devices, almost solely through MMU, because you get a, you get a, a chance to mark certain memory mapped I.O. Uh, address spaces as inaccessible to the guest or as read-only to the guest or whatever else. And that way, you can actually interpose in a more simplistic manner than on the x86 case. 